So Peg founded a solar energy company in New Jersey in 1978, a year before President Carter put the solar panels on the roof of the White House. And then, of course, Reagan took them off uh, in 82. Apparently, solar was communist. Um, and, and trees give off pollution. So that was my favorite. Uh, yeah. But uh, Peg worked in uh, the pharmaceutical and the biotech industries. Um, she's been leading the North County chapter of Citizens Climate Lobby since 2010. Uh, Peg is the Dan Franking campaign director with San Diego 350.org. You're wearing the 350 colors tonight. That's awesome. <laughs> Terrific organization. You guys had a huge, huge uh, turnout for the, 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 the March last yeah. fall. That was fantastic. Yeah. That was great. And uh, Peg is also a member of, as we said, the uh, Lake San Marcos Democratic Club, which is this year's Club of the Year for the work getting the uh, Democratic message out in a very, very red corner of the county. So, yes. <laughs> Peg Mitchell. Thank you. Here. Thank you very much. I, I appreciate you uh, inviting me to be here tonight. Um, I see a few faces who have seen uh, this talk before, but don't run away because this is an ever-changing field and uh, there has been so much new, hold on, I gotta make sure I'm not shutting down here, cancel, cancel, cancel. There's so much new going on that um, uh, I actually spent most of today updating this for all of the outcomes and, and things that have been going on in just the last three months. It's just moving that fast. So there's going to be new information after sort of the fracking 101 basics. Can you see the screen okay from where you're back there? Should we? We're good? Okay. Um, so first of all, a um, little bit, uh, two sentences, three sentences about San Diego 350 if you don't know who we are. Uh, we are an all-volunteer grassroots organization. We have uh, um, over 3,000 members now and uh, a couple of hundred who are very, very active in various activities. Uh, our sole mission is to educate and advocate for all things to mitigate climate change. Our sole focus is really about all things related to mitigating climate change and helping get the message out to educate people about that. Uh, we don't have any paid staff or anything else, so, so it's, a, like I said, all volunteer grassroots. Uh, we've gotten very involved in, uh, for example, the San Diego City Climate Action Plan. Uh, we've gotten uh, lots of protests, as you probably even at some point maybe participated in against various things going on. So uh, pretty active organization. Uh, so um, as uh, Tommy said, I lead the band fracking. And uh, I do say the word band because basically, because we are about climate change, it's really about leaving the oil in the soil, ultimately. Fracking happens to be just one of various methods California uses to try to get that out. So, so let's jump right into it and talk a little bit about fracking. That's why we're here. So I usually start with this, although I, I can predict the outcome here. But first of all, raise your hand if you've heard of fracking, which should be just about everybody by now. Now, keep your hand up if you knew before tonight that we were already fracking in California. Was everybody already aware of that? When I started this two years ago, about maybe half the audience would raise their hand that they knew about fracking and almost nobody raised their hand knowing it was going on in California. That was pretty much how our legislature found out about it too. Mm -hmm. So uh, they weren't even aware until 2011 that something was going on. So real quick so that we all know what we're talking about, what is fracking? Short for hydraulic fra fracturing. Uh, they blame the environmental community for the word fracking because it sounds very close to something else that's a little, <laughs> little derogatory. So uh, they think we like that word. But basically, it's a well stimulation method, a way to get oil and gas out of the ground by drilling very deep and sometimes horizontally as well, uh, and then injecting water and sand and chemicals, hundreds of chemicals, highly toxic chemicals, down into the shale bed, and sometimes then making left and right turns to go through the shale bed to then explode this to crack the shale bed that then releases uh, not pools of oil or gas the way you would think of Beverly Hillbillies, and that's conventional oil. Those days are gone. We don't have gushers anymore. We're going after the, the source molecule, the source hydrocarbon in the shale itself. That's why they have to fracture it, break it all apart, to get that stuff to come up, and all those chemicals are necessary in order to make that process happen so that it can flow back up with all the other junk that was already down there that should have stayed down there millions of years. So a lot of radioactive elements, cadmium, arsenic, et cetera, come back up with even more water that was down there and all the toxic chemicals that they put down there also all comes back up as wastewater. And then behind that comes the oil and gas <coughs> that is needed that they're trying to get 
Um, and then they got to do something with that wastewater. So we're going we're gonna to talk a little bit more about that. Um, this is just a, a sample. This is probably more what it looks like in Pennsylvania, Tommy, because their shale beds are very flat. Uh, most of the shale beds in the country are fairly flat. Um, however, um, what you can see here is, so this is just, uh, you know, the well pad, this is the blowout preventer, that's, I think BP oil spill, that's one point of failure. Then they have a well board that comes all the way down. This is cement casing. Cement lasts, what, maybe 20 years? One in five wells fails in the cement casing in the first year, so this is a source of leakage here. But they put the casing through the aquifer until they think they're deep enough to be safe, and then they continue drilling until they get the shale bed. Um, this is where they fracture the shale, so there's potential leakage from here. This is one example of a pit where there's, there's a contamination from that, not to mention gas flaring and all the other methane that comes out as a result of this process. But I want to point to this picture here. I don't know if you can see it. It's very convoluted, almost looks like oscilloscope waves. That's our shale. Uh, we don't have flat shale beds because our shale beds um, run right along our major seismic faults. And that's the result of seismic action folding our earth like an accordion. This is the main reason that fracking has not taken off in California the way it has elsewhere, because they have not yet found the magic solution to making these wells continue to produce with this method over the long term. They're trying. They're trying very hard. And when fracking doesn't work, they're moving to something called matrix acidization, which is basically flooding the shale, the rock bed, with hydrofluoric acid. Oh, that's another highly toxic chemical, to just melt it away. So they're working on that as well. So that's, that's kind of what it looks like. Now, the, um, the other thing that I want to say is uh, it's happening. So this is a map of California. And all of the orange areas here is the Monterey shale fields. That's our shale fields here in California, where originally they said, oh, 15.4 billion barrels of oil, recoverable oil. And then within, within about eight months, oh, we have to downgrade that to 13.7. And then finally, the year after EIA came out and said, well, it's actually 600 million barrels of recoverable oil. Frankly, I'm not sure they know. But if we were to pull all that out, it's about six days worth of global oil use because um, of, of demand, or one month's worth for California. So is it really worth what we're doing to the environment as a result? Uh, now, I also want to point out this blue line here. This is the San Andreas Fault. OK, so it runs right through the middle of our shale fields. And lots of other fault lines as well. Those are the main ones. But we know that there are many, many fault lines down there. Uh, and so, as I said, that's really convoluted our shale beds, which uh, actually might be helping us right now. Uh, we have lagged behind with regulation. We passed SB4 back in 2012, I believe that's just being implemented now. Uh, it's the first regulation. It's, it's better, but it's got still a lot of loopholes. But we're beginning, as a result of that, to learn a little bit more now about what's actually going on than we knew before. But we have a long way to go. Um, I want to point all out also, so, so could it happen here? A lot of people ask me, well, what about San Diego? Well, this is the Monterey Shale as it comes down the coast. So here's the San Andreas Fault. Here's San Diego. OK, this is shale bed, onshore, offshore. Uh, I got this map from a project called Mars at, uh, up at uh, the university up in Long Beach. And they're actually exploring in terms of trying to figure out where else could they explore if they're successful. So this is not something that's imminently happening or going to happen soon. But they had predicted if they find the magic solution within five to seven years, they'll just continue coming on down. There's already offshore fracking going on off of the uh, platforms off Santa Barbara and Long Beach, uh, federal platforms, um, and they're dumping the fracking fluid into the ocean, the wastewater. And the EPA, when we found out about it, uh, there was a lot of Cal EPA, Fed EPA finger pointing. Uh, and the final result was as of last, last March, the EPA, the federal EPA said, Okay, now we know that you're doing this, we're going to let you put 9 billion gallons 
up to 9 billion gallons into the ocean. So that's where we are with that. Uh, the other thing I want to point out, I have to read some numbers here, is that um, in places like Pennsylvania, Tommy, uh, a lot of the fracking is for natural gas, um, which is the big thing right now. California, it's not for gas, it's for oil. Uh, it's about, depending on who you talk to, a 90-10 split between oil and the gas that naturally comes out with it. Um, but the thing to know is that uh, as a result of AB32, we know that CARB had to uh, basically determine the carbon intensity of all different forms of uh, possible pollutants, et cetera. So they have a scale, and don't ask me exactly what the scale indicates, but the higher the number, the more carbon intensive, the more dirty the source of fuel is, or the source of the emissions is. And so when you talk about conventional oil, the regular light sweet crude that's, uh, you know, fairly cleaner, um, it can be rated anywhere between 5 and 13. So that's the carbon intensity of conventional oil. So you know, we've all been fighting against the tar sands in Alberta, Keystone Pipeline, all that. That tar sands oil is rated anywhere from 21.02 to 24.49. So that's a lot more than the conventional oil. You know what this oil is rated at? Depending on where you are in the shale field, anywhere from 21.18 to 28.82. So it's the dirtiest oil we know about. Okay, so I'm not sure why Jerry Brown thinks we ought to be getting it out. Um, the other thing to know is that fracking is also, in spite of what Jerry Brown says, been around for years and years and years. Um, it's the way things have been combined that is new. So elements of the process, isolated by themselves, have been used over time, one or another. But when all put together with the high volume, with the extreme depth of drilling, with the horizontal drilling capability, having maybe as many as eight wells coming out from a single well pad, all of that is new, put together, and in, since roughly 2005. Um, and what they're doing here, or trying to do in California, is re-stimulate old wells, conventional wells that really aren't producing anymore, to see if they can tease out a little bit more. So that's the first attempt that they've been doing in California. So we're, it, we're still crawling. We're not raging away like Pennsylvania, which is why we want to get in front of it before it really does take off or find success. Um, but it really is only a matter of time. This is what we're doing across the country. Um, all the pink and the purple is where our fracking is going on. Uh, that's a pretty pretty big part of our country uh, that we're polluting, that we're, that we're just tearing apart. This is the North Dakota Bakken field up here. And this is the Eagle Ford bed in Texas. And I circled those two because those two also uh, frack more for oil than for gas, uh, the way we are trying to do here in California. And so, uh, in fact, they had, they had uh, estimated that the combination of those two equates to what's in the Monterey field if they can get it out. I don't know if that's really true. But uh, most of this over here, which is happening in the Marcellus Shale field, Tommy, that's natural gas more than anything else. So it's, um, it's, it's huge and uh, highly, highly polluting. So what are, question? Um, isn't the oil what's been causing all those horrible fiery train crashes? Yes, because when that oil comes back up, as I said, it's mixed with a lot of, of these chemicals. Sorry, I've been out in the desert for two and a half oh, weeks, okay. and there was a lot of wind storms and sand blowing around for the last two days, so I ingested some of that. But anyway, um, yeah, so with the, the, a lot of what they're thinking is that, that that oil's much more volatile because it has some of the residual toxicity that still remains from the chemicals that were part of the process. And as a result, the bomb trains. And trust me, they are coming through into California. Uh, they're ramping up big time. And so there's a lot of activity, especially farther north, organizing to get in front of that. So that's another, another thing we need to watch. So what are some of the risks that we've talked about? Well, the first one, obviously, with the San Andreas Fault running right straight through our shale fields, uh, we call them frack quakes. But um, interestingly enough, we always thought of California as the most, si most seismically active state in the nation. And we were until fracking came along. 
So this graph here is from Oklahoma, and I'm sure you've heard in the news over, over the last year or so about uh, all of the number of earthquakes in Texas and Oklahoma and what's been going on. And the drillers saying, oh, it's not us, it's not us, fracking doesn't cause earthquakes. Well, they're right. Fracking doesn't cause earthquakes. It's the re-injection into old wells of the wastewater that's causing the earthquakes. Although in Ohio, there is exact one case that they were able to actually link directly to the fracking action itself. But all the rest of it has primarily been from the re-injection wells, which are, again, re the, the fluids are re-injected under pressure. And uh, they're very beginning to get very concerned about how if we keep putting all this stuff across that map that I showed you all over the country, we are literally changing the pressures, the full f uh, fluid volumes uh, of the faults themselves. And uh, you know, things are shaken up. So if you look here, the, the big fracking boom was roughly in starting about 2005. So when you look at the number of earthquakes in Oklahoma, and this is the scale of magnitude, um, and the, the, the raw number of them, going from almost unmeasurable in 07 to 2611 in 2013. I don't know what the 2014 numbers are, but I bet you it's a lot higher even than that. It got so severe that finally the US Geological Survey decided that we really need to study this, and their study just came out in February, and their conclusion was the increased seismicity is in fact directly due to the fluid reejection. Um, so, they are causing earthquakes. So, is that really, you know, let's, let's, what, what does that look like? So, basically, you frack the well, the stuff comes back up, the oil and gas goes into storage, the wastewater goes into a pit, eventually into a truck to be hauled away, to be re-injected back down an old well, where then once enough pressure's built up, you get an earthquake generally of a small size, but it's been enough in Texas and Oklahoma to ruin homes, to break foundations, to crack houses, and uh, it's not a pretty picture. And in fact, uh, a number of folks, communities and people in Texas are actually suing the oil companies now for damages as a result of this. So this is a map. Uh, I, if I were to zoom down each of those diamonds or squares, whatever you want to call it here, this is just, well, the closest section that I could get on the back, uh, showing where all of our re-injection wells is, this is Lompoc, Santa Barbara area, on down. And each of these squares is actually, the farther, the closer you zoom down, those squares blow up into multiples and multiples of individual wells. Um, but you can see that we've got hundreds and thousands of them. This is the San Andreas Fault, right here. So we have reinjection wells all around the seismic zones. And that's the main fault. There's, like I said, other faults that, that are offshoots of that. So now you wonder, OK, we're, why, we're why build the well on the fault? Well, because first of all, old wells. yeah, a lot of those wells once were oil producing wells that have now dried up. They, they're, they're depleted. Production has declined. So they now reuse them for this purpose. So that's, that's the first way that they get rid of that stuff. But um, let's talk a little bit about what's in that water. Um, first of all, it's important to know that more water even than what's injected comes back up because of what, what's already down there. So in 2013, the industry produced 130 billion gallons of wastewater to produce 8 billion gallons of oil, a ratio of 15 to 1. That was just in 2013, and all that has to be disposed of in some way. So they, they dispose of it in four ways. It's primarily re-injected, as I already described. Uh, it can also be cleaned up a little bit and used for irrigating your crops in the Central Valley, believe it or not. Uh, and then, of course, it can be also cleaned up some and reused on a fracking, a new fracking job. Uh, or, lastly, stored in an open pit, as I showed you on that first original diagram. We do all four of those methods of disposal, but as I said, about 80% is disposed via underground injection. Now, thanks to SB4, for the first time, it just went into effect January 1st, although there was a, a temporary version of it in effect the previous year. 
So for the first time, the drillers have to now disclose what they are ejecting. Uh, problem is they have to disclose it 60 days after they're done. Uh, and it's self-reporting. Nobody's really checking up on them. And so there is a database that's in some state of ability to mine that data, if you know what it, what it, how it's organized. Uh, so environmental working group decided to look at the first year of, of reported data uh, from about six oil companies. Not only one, ERA was the only one that actually filed complete information. The other five, it was all full of holes, so we don't even have a complete picture. And yet, and there's a report that they just put out called Toxic Stew. If you Google environmental working group, Toxic Stew, you can read all the details about what they found. But basically, all those chemicals we have to warn everybody about from Prop 65, every one of them was in that water just about. A lot of those samples, um, you know, a lot of those uh, are carcinogenic, they're endocrine disruptors, uh, the health hazards to the people living up in Bakersfield, Central Valley, San Joaquin Valley area is horrific. And I've been up there, I visited with these people, and, and I could do a whole other thing on just the environmental justice aspect. But it is really, really toxic. Uh, and, and um, affecting people's health because of also the air pollution that results, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and then, of course, because as I said, it brings back up with it the stuff that was down there, the normally, uh, the norm products, the radioactive elements. Uh, they also found lots of radioactive radium and uh, lots of things way above the, the levels that are uh, allowed by the state. In a particular, Center for Biological Diversity found that 98% of the fracking wastewater had levels of benzene way, way, way above the allowable limit. And when you think about a, one teaspoon of benzene can pollute 250,000 gallons of water beyond use. One teaspoon. So this is not a good situation at a time when every drop is precious with the drought conditions that we are under. So, you know, that's what is in the water. So, is it contaminating our aquifers? What's happening from these reinjection wells? Well, that's still an open question. Um, now, this is some of the new stuff that's just happened this summer. I don't know if you heard about it in the news, but um, suddenly last July, so July 2014, there was big news because 11 reinjection wells up near Bakersfield were uh, in the Kern River oil field were shut down because they were discovered that uh, there's a process because of the Safe Drinking Water Act the EPA has the right to say these aquifers must be protected because they are, number one, not polluted currently, number two, they are pure enough that they could be used for drinking water or irrigation purposes, and number three, they're likely to be uh, accessible at some point in the future. So those are non-exempt aquifers. An exempt aquifer is one that's either already polluted already because of farm runoff or whatever, whatever reasons, considered way too deep to ever be reasonably uh, used, or, or other reasons that just can be verified that that water cannot be for human consumption. So those are exempt aquifers. I'm sorry to interrupt, but is the, so are the reinjection wells not part of the Halliburton? Well, they're, 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 they're the underground injection in California is actually controlled by a program called the underground UIC, Underground Injection Control Program. And so that um, fracking itself is exempt from those federal laws, but this wastewater under our California UIC program is subject to uh, being sure that they at least are not injecting that stuff so into... Some like a unique finding. Yeah. But it's a non-exempt aquifer that, that needs to be protected for drinking purposes, and that's the main role of the EPA. So, um, so basically, what they found was that Dogger, the Department of Gas and Geothermal Resources, um, had, had conflicting documentation. One set of documentation said these 11 aquifers were exempt, and the other, 11, the other documentation said they weren't. And it turned out they were non-exempt, uh, but they had permitted them and were and we're subject to having all these reinjection wells. So these 11 wells were shut down, now there's 23. Three billion gallons were already injected into them. So the EPA stepped in, has the state doing a complete audit of every reinjection well. They have, uh, Dogger gave them a, a plan, a timeline for which they plan to complete this audit. 
starting with uh, prioritization of those most likely and susceptible to be near uh, non-exempt aquifers and then working out from there. Uh, with the goal of having the elimination of ex injection into existing aquifers phased out by 2017. So meanwhile, for two more years, they're going to be allowed to keep doing this uh, while they figure out what they're doing, which makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. So what could we do? Um, maybe we need to just stop injecting and store it in open pits. Is that any better? Well, we tried that too. So this example is just in the Central Valley, where your food is grown, okay? <laughs> so, <laughs> in the Central Valley, <clears throat> it's called a, an open-air pit. So it's a huge pit. In fact, let me just go to the next slide, because that's one example in the Kittrick. So it's an open pit, mostly unlined, with the goal that it leaches through the soil, which supposedly, theoretically, kind of cleans it and dilutes it as it goes through the soil, or it evaporates into the air, which causes volatile organic compounds and all kinds of air pollution. And when you combine that with the diesel fluid, diesel fumes from the trucks that are bringing all this fluid in, it creates ground level ozone levels that are way out of control. So we have 432 unlined pits, they're called sump pits, that are up there identified as actively in use in 198 that are idle but could potentially be used in the future. And most of them are just operating with no regulatory oversight, and in a lot of cases, Dogger didn't even know they were there. Uh, um, I'll let you read the details there, but most of them are very near waterways. Um, and a lot of these non-priority pits, that they're, they're also now looking at where are these pits relative to our aquifers and water sources. And they prioritize trying to figure all this out by saying which ones are closest to protected waterways. And we'll start there. Well, the problem is, is that even though some, like those McKittrick ones I showed you, that are not directly near a waterway, they already have a plume that is running in the direction of the waterway because that's the flow underground. And so there's still uh, a potential danger. Uh, and there's one in particular in the Ch McKittrick where um, in the Belgrade oil field where current testing shows that it's, there's already a 4,000 foot plume heading towards high ground, quality groundwater that's only a mile and a half away. And it, it's continuing to go. So, and that's a non-priority pit. So, uh, you know, that's kind of kind of where we are with the storage thing. So I showed you the picture there. So this is in Kern County up in the Bakersfield area. This is where all the open pits are. The green squares are the active pits. The yellow squares are the uh, inactive idle pits. And again, if you were to go way down on this, you would see more dots that, that explode. I, I don't have internet here, so I can't, but if, the, if I went out, if you went out to this link here, it's a whole map, interactive map that you can look at, and it's just uh, mind boggling, absolutely mind boggling. So, what can we do about this? This is not a good situation. And mind you, this wastewater is not just from fracking. Let me be clear that it's from all the oil stimulation activity, because we have, um, you know, for all the talk about fracking, um, the biggest concern is the seismicity issues and the toxicity issues. However, when you talk about water use, generally fracking uses millions and millions and millions of gallons of water in other parts of the country, like in Pennsylvania, Oklahoma, Texas, millions up to anywhere from five to eight million gallons per frack uh, each time. In California, it's a few hundred thousand right now because of the difference of our geology. However, these pits and the reinjection wells are taking wastewater from all forms of oil uh, well stimulation, which includes the, the, the more common method, which is called cyclic steam injection. So they have a little power plant on site that creates steam, boils water to create steam to then inject down there, again, to, to work similarly to, to fracking under high pressure the heat and everything makes the, the oil flow and then it comes up. And that is also producing even more wastewater than currently fracking is. And using a lot more of our fresh water, groundwater, uh, um, at the moment. So basically the entire oil industry in California is run amok. And Dogger has lost their ability to monitor and regulate what's going on. Uh, and there's a lot, of, a lot of pain going on here. <clears throat> so what can we do? There's a new bill that just went into the assembly. Um, 
8356 Das Williams from Santa Barbara, which would basically um, reform to a degree the underground injection control program so that it would basically um, close some of the loopholes that are allowing this to happen. But it's not going to be enough, and we'd love to see it amended so that it actually forces them to stop doing all this until we understand the audits are finished, we know what we're doing, and we know how to control this so that there's no, uh, you know, um, undue effects that are impossible to undo once an aquifer is, is polluted. Um, but basically, you know, there's a lot of evidence that shows that we are just, even if we had a strong regulatory environment, we don't have a strong regulatory body that's enforcing those rules. So bottom line is it really just has to stop. But we'd love to be able to, um, on Friday, I have a letter here, eight, eight legislators, none from San Diego, um, sent a letter to Governor Brown demanding that um, you know, they, they stop all the underground injection until they completely understand what's going on. Fran Pagley is um, thinking about, uh, this was a quick 24-hour turnaround last Friday, so she only was able to get eight, two senators, six assembly members to sign. She's considering redoing it and trying to get all of, many more legislators to sign on. So one of the things that we'll do if she does that uh, soon is start getting calls into our local San Diego contingent so that they can sign on to that letter as well. I met with Tony Atkins on Friday. She's aware, in fact, it was in our meeting with her when it hit this, this came into the email and we found out this had been delivered, so she's aware. It'd be great to get everybody signed on. So if you want to take a look at that, you can. Um, but anyway, bottom line is, with the way we are with our drought and with climate change, I don't understand why Jerry Brown has such strong support for the oil and gas industry. We do not have a state oil extraction tax. It's not as though we are making tons of money off of this industry. There's a 4.5% fee they pay that supports and funds Dogger. That's it. So they're getting to, to, to basically run roughshod over our environment and our water sources, and um, we're not quite sure why Jerry Brown thinks this is such a wonderful thing for California. So why should we care here in San Diego? Uh, I don't think I'm, I need to tell you much of this. I'm preaching to the choir, but it's all about the water in San Diego. It's at the end of the pipeline. 80% of our water is imported. Most of our water comes from either the Sierra non-existing now snowpack <laughs> or from the Colorado almost never flows to the ocean Colorado River. Um, <clears throat> we know that the uh, large majority of use of our water is for agriculture, and we know that they've already gotten 0% allocation from the state water project second year in a row, and a lot of uh, uh, agricultural workers are already out of jobs because of that. And um, there's a lot of you, if you go up there, um, you'll see a lot of the, uh, even the orchards now being just plowed over. Um, and part of the problem is the fact that, now, thanks goodness, we now just passed our very first groundwater management bill, which has not yet gone into effect. Um, so it's been a free for all. So what's been going on up there is you got the farmers who have been relying on groundwater because they didn't get their allocation for the last two years from the state water project. So they've been sucking the water out of the ground, and their wells were never all that deep because the water was down there. Well, then next door, and I, I wish I had some pictures to show you that I've taken up there, you see the fracking rigs right like on the other side of the field, in some cases right in the middle of the orchard. Well, they're using the groundwater too, and the oil companies have a lot more money to drill a lot deeper. So the farmers have found their wells going dry and the drillers next door dr drilling much deeper wells to get to the water that's left. So you may have heard about the subsidence problem that's happening up there where the ground is literally sinking and it's happening far faster than everybody ever thought would happen. And that's what's going on is the farmers and the drillers are seeing who can, who can suck the most water out first and the, dr the drillers are winning. Um, but in order to mitigate this problem, what are we looking at? We're looking at things like the desal plant in Carlsbad. And if that's successful, many more. Counties on the hook for $110 million a year to buy that water from Poseidon. We're looking at direct to tap, toilet to tap, whatever they're calling it now. Uh, again, very expensive. Um, we're going to be asked to probably ration and severely restrict our usage at some point while we pay for very expensive Delta Bay tunnels that probably I will never see in my lifetime. And even if I did, I don't think they're going to solve the problem. So all of those things are great, but it's the most expensive gallon of water we could have. 
So an acre foot of water is enough water to have one foot deep over an acre, which is roughly 365,000 gallons. An acre foot of what we call local water, which is uh, Lake Hodges, our local reservoirs, is about $50 an acre foot. What we call imported water, water we get from either Imperial Irrigation District or Metropolitan Water District, is about $200, $250 an acre foot. Water from the deep cell plant or from the recycling effort is going to run over $2,000 an acre foot. And so we're talking about the, uh, the most expensive gallon of water and the measures that we're going through while we're just letting it be squandered to get oil out of the ground so we can keep burning it to keep causing climate change and just keep this vicious cycle going. So it just doesn't make sense. And um, these uh, I got from the San Diego Water Authority. This is the predictions um, of the forecast for drought through 2050 if you factor in climate change, so the redder, the more extreme, or if you don't factor in climate change, this is what it looks like. So gee, we go from extreme to hot if there's no climate change. And of course, we know there's climate change happening. Um, the way San Diego plans to diversify its water supply is to really rely a lot on conservation um, and a lot on desal, except the desal plant's going to only solve seven, it's going to serve 7% of our needs. That's it for that very extensive water. So they're really relying heavily on a big conservation effort in the future. But nobody talks about conserving it in ways that are meaningful. Uh, this is the drought status as of uh, last week. So that's not a pretty picture. Again, the darker, the worst. Uh, if you look at the history, it's actually gotten just a tad better. Uh, this is the percentage of the state that is in the various different conditions. Um, ex exceptional drought, the darkest here. Um, a year ago was at 22% of the state, got to a high of 58, went back down to 32%, and now we're creeping back up uh, now roughly 40% again. And we are at the end of our rainy season, so I don't expect this picture to change uh, for the better anytime soon. So now I think I want to get just a little bit here before I wrap up into a little bit about the economics of, of oil. Um, you know, you've heard an awful lot about, even President Obama talking about how, you know, we can have 100 years of energy independence. Uh, we can be Saudi Arabia, the Saudi Arabia of North America. All this hype about all these wonderful resources that we have. Um, well, it's really, really important to understand that fracking a well causes extreme uh, declines very, very quickly. So think of a soda bottle. You shake up a soda bottle that's <coughs> new. You open it up, it explodes, right? You put the lid back on, let it settle down, shake it up again, it'll explode again, but a little less. And if you keep doing that, eventually it goes flat. Well, that's what happens with a fracked well. Most fracked wells uh, decline about 60% by the end of the first year. And by the end of year two, they've declined 90%. And the data is there. I've looked at it. So, uh, and I'm not a I'm not a scientist. Uh, <laughs> uh, there are oil analysts who have looked at this and written lots of great reports. But you know, basically, production declines so quickly that 40% of all the output has to be replaced by new drilling in new spots just to keep production levels flat, let alone increasing. So when you hear President Obama or others talk about how you know we've now hit the million barrel or, or whatever a day level. Well, they were out there drilling like crazy to find new spots. And, and basically, the very first wells <coughs> that, that, uh, that they hit that are produced, they find the sweet spot first. So when this whole boom began back in 2005, generally, the best spots were the first spots. Because once they, they make a hit, then they keep moving out from there. So a lot of the best spots have already been tapped and declined. So we're on this drilling treadmill. And basically, even before oil prices plummeted, they were losing their shirts. Investors were losing their shirts. This is a very capital-intensive process. Think if we put all this capital into renewable resources, into energy research, into storage solutions. We don't need to be building all this infrastructure for a future that we can't support. So basically, even Rex Tillerson, CEO of ExxonMobil, and this was last year, this wasn't since the, uh, the oil collapse. You know, he says they're losing their shirts. 
It's all in the red. And now there's very high unemployment uh, as a result of the plummeting price. They need roughly $85 a barrel uh, in order to make fracking break even. And uh, this week we're down in the $40 range. It's kind of went back up a little bit. I'm, I don't quite understand how Yemen falling apart, but I guess because Saudi Arabia moved in and protecting their oil fields, then anyway, I'm not quite sure, but the price went up some today. Uh, but anyhow, um, but if the price keeps dropping, that's actually in our favor, not only because our gasoline will be cheap, <laughs> but because it's drying up fracking here in the States. And the reason that we have cheap energy prices right now is that in order to, as I said, keep production numbers looking like they're increasing, they had to keep drilling. And when they get their leases from the BLM, they have to start drilling within a year or they lose the lease. So they've been out there drilling like crazy, totally forgetting about supply and demand economics, and now we have a huge oversupply. And within probably a month or two, we run out of places in the US to even store what they've already pulled out of the ground. They're, they're now looking for places. In fact, the, the federal government's going to buy a bunch for the Federal Strategic Reserve because they need somewhere to put this stuff. But they keep drilling. They keep drilling. Um, so the only thing that slowed it down was the drop in oil prices. Um, so basically, if we want to claim that we can be truly energy independent, and from a national security perspective, be a lot safer than we are today, New, looking to renewables, energy efficiency, and reduce consumption is where we need to be going instead of really forcing our way through all this fossil fuel consumption. Here's just one example from North Dakota to just show you what I mean. So in 1990, when they really started, and then they really started fracking in 2005, right here, so here's where they crossed. So this is the number of wells in the Bakken, and this is the, and this is natural gas. Uh, this, but I have a similar chart that, that we show it for oil as well. This is the well productivity rates. So look at this. In spite of, fracking comes in right around 2005. So we've had what? Uh, um, a 90% increase in wells and a 38% decrease in production of output. And that's exactly what happens. In order to keep this production treadmill going to look like we're increasing our supply, they need to keep drilling. So you're going to see things change pretty quick if the oil prices stay low. And in fact, the investment community is getting a little nervous now because they've sunk a lot of investment into this, but they've not seen great returns and it's getting much, much worse. So a lot of that capital is pulling out and going into renewables. That's a good thing. Um, you know, so um, since 2000, investments increased threefold by 180%, but we've only increased global supply by 14%. Um, so basically, 80% of investments in oil and gas and 90% of the investment going into oil is just to keep production levels flat. That's it. We're not moving forward. Um, so, you know, I ask, what's the logic here? It, it defies me. For someone like Jerry Brown, who I thought was pretty smart, yeah. I, I, I just don't understand this. So basically, you know, we're talking about pulling out fossil fuels, increasing our CO2 emissions when we burn it, you know, climate change is intensifying, we have droughts, wildfires, all those impacts that we know about. Jerry Brown declared a drought emergency last year, but we're still using more water to frack more fossil fuels so that we can just repeat the cycle, and I really have to question why we do this, because it makes no sense to me. But the good news basically is that there is a silver lining because this is all forcing the renewables investment and we can make this transition happen. We just need to find the political will to do so. And I think the will is out there because opposition is growing. This is a public policy institute poll just came out. Uh, and Californians, um, this is July 2015, sorry. Um, Californians do oppose fracking. 54% overall. In San Diego, 55% when asked the question, do you favor or oppose increased use of hydraulic fracturing or fracking? And so there is a lot of opposition. When they did this poll last May in 2014, it was roughly the same number. So um, an even greater majority opposes the acidization process, if, if you know about that. Um, the Democrats and independents said it. We need, we need a few more Republicans to come on board as well. But that's still, you know, a fairly high number, I think, for in California for people opposed to fracking. 
So basically, um, that, you know, that's it. I, I, you know, in terms of what you can do, well, you can come join my campaign. There's a sign-up sheet back there if you want to volunteer. Uh, but 350 really works on that. Um, the other thing is, um, you know, you've heard me mention Citizens Climate Lobby. We, uh, that organization is focused on purely lobbying the federal government, Congress, for something called carbon fee and dividend, uh, which we prefer over AB 32 cap and trade, but we'll take what we get. Um, basically, carbon fee and dividend would put a steadily rising fee on carbon, like a carbon tax, kind of, except the difference is that it would be returned 100% to households to offset any higher costs that are passed through. I'm not here to talk about that today, but we, there's lots of data that shows this would be a huge econ positive economic outcome for the country in terms of creating both jobs and reducing emissions, uh, while letting sort of a f more of a free market approach happen that conservatives actually like very much, except Duncan Hunter, but that's a different story. <laughs> uh, and then, of course, you know, what can you do? Um, I'll let you know if Fran Pavley starts circulating that letter, but either way, I think we should be calling our state assembly and senators to, to, to demand that something happen with this aquifer and uh, reinjection problem. Um, the other thing I've been trying to do, multiple counties and cities farther north where most of the action is, have passed resolutions urging the governor to put a ban or moratorium on it, or they've passed their own. Uh, I had multiple meetings with Dave Roberts last year trying to get San Diego County to do something. Uh, he was sort of on board for a while and then it kind of fizzled, so uh, I don't know if we want to go back there, but we'd love to at least educate the city councils of San Diego so that they're aware and can help maybe bring pressure when applied. If you'd like to help educate your city council member, please let me know. Um, you know, support the fee and dividend. The UT San Diego is so pro-fracking, it makes me crazy. Um, and so anytime you see one of their editorials out there, write a letter to the editor, put a comment online, uh, set the record straight, because uh, they love to distort it. Um, most importantly, be informed, vote, and challenge anybody running for office where they stand on all these issues. And based on what they say, you know how you ought to vote. Get the word out to everybody that you know. So with that, uh, any questions? I know I went really fast, but... Um, Let's get a round of applause for Peggy. <laughs>